Okay, well, good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for another episode of the Jane Irrigation Training Series. I'm uh, Richard Rastusha, Vice President of Water Management Solutions for Jane Irrigation, and today we're getting back to basics. And I always love this because no matter what I'm doing, I find that if I review some basics or look at uh, the basics of what I'm doing, breaking down what I'm doing to the mere basics, I always get better by doing that. And so today, the basics we're going to be talking about is valves, filters, and regulators in your drip system. And uh, the other thing that I really do like about this subject is that I can't tell you how many times I've uh, talked to somebody troubleshooting a system and I've asked them, well, when was the last time you uh, cleaned your filter? And, uh, and too often I hear what filter, I didn't know I was supposed to have a filter. So uh, we're gonna help people today really understand what a filter's for and how to size that filter. And then also, you know, pressure regulation is really important for uh, water management. And, uh, and, and we're gonna talk about that as well. So whether you're an irrigation pro or just new to the business or a property manager or a uh, building manager, I think today's uh, information you're gonna find very useful, uh, especially because we've got Andy Bellingeri, National Sales Manager for Jane Irrigation with us today talking about this. Uh, I love it when uh, Andy presents. Uh, he's a, uh, a horticulture major out of uh, BYU. He's been in the industry for over 20 years now. He's uh, worked for contractors, uh, actually run crews. He really knows the ins and outs of uh, irrigation and landscaping. And we're really fortunate to having, uh, have uh, Andy here today. So Andy, welcome. How are you today? I'm doing great, Richard. Uh, glad to be back and thank you for the kind introduction. Yeah, so Andy, I think you're, uh, you're in Las Vegas, Nevada today. Is that right? Uh, Henderson to be exact, the Las okay. Vegas Valley, yes. Okay, great. So how is the weather there? I'm starting to be concerned about what I'm seeing for lack of rainfall and, and, and some other things. So I yeah. got some rain today. Is it hot? What's going on there? Oh, it's, uh, today we're going to be in the, the low to mid 60s. Tomorrow we get close to 70 and uh, Friday it gets even warmer. You know, it's crazy looking at the weather. Uh, Phoenix, uh, 76, Vegas, 70, the LA area, 82, and then 84 by Friday. Um, and then specifically here in the Las Vegas Valley for weather, the last significant amount of rain that we had was the weekend right before the big national shutdown for COVID uh, back in the middle of March. Since then, we've had one recordable, one measurable rain event, and I wanna say it was four one hundredths of an inch. So it's warm, it's been warm, and it's been dry. This is the first winter in, I can't tell you how many years where I've needed to uh, uh, water my landscape. I have not completely shut off my, my, um, my irrigation system. And uh, it's, it's uh, granted, it might be only one or two irrigation cycles, but still that's, uh, that's, that's not common. So is this local to uh, just uh, Henderson and Las Vegas or is this something that's happening all over the West? Yeah, so yeah, great question. Um, uh, all throughout the, the West, and just kind of jumping to the presentation here, I got a, I got a great map that will show that uh, here. Um, if we just practice advancing slides in advance. <laughs> now, of course, technology isn't going to, to start with us, but uh, it'll, it'll, it'll jump here in a second. But there is a, uh, a, a map, the U.S. Drought Monitor map, and it goes from white, meaning uh, no drought. I apologize. Um, slides aren't advancing right now. White from means no drought. You get to, to tan and yellow and kind of a uh, orange and then red and then the deepest, darkest kind of maroon brown color is exceptional drought. And when you look at that map, oh, here we go. Finally got it to work. When you look at this map here, this deepest, darkest color it covers Southern and Eastern Nevada, most of Arizona, most of Utah, a good chunk of Colorado and New Mexico. But you look at this blue line running right through here, that's the Colorado River. So the Colorado River Basin is in the worst drought possible, right? That they measure what they call exceptional drought. Uh, that means the, there's not a lot of snow in the Rockies, not a lot of precipitation. Um, uh, th th this is bad for January. Of course, you look out here in, in Southern California, you know, if any of our guys uh, joining us from Southern California, they say, well, I'm in LA County or Orange County or San Diego County and we're, 
we're either abnormal or moderate. We don't have much of a, uh, a drought issue. Um, I like to remind them that uh, the population centers, this map shows the population centers that depend on the Colorado River Basin. So just because your specific geographic area may not be in drought conditions, the water you depend on is in exceptional drought conditions. And uh, it's especially true for the Phoenix and uh, greater uh, Southern California, LA, Orange County, San Diego areas, uh, even Las Vegas that depend on that Colorado River water. Um, and, I know for my... and, and I don't share any of this to be alarmist, right? Uh, we've seen drought. We've seen that last year at this time, the, the, the Sierras and the Rockies got a ton of water and got us out of drought. We were at zero drought, right? Uh, got a great late uh, storm. We've had other years that have been drought before. It's cyclical. We understand this. We know this. But it just means we have to be ever vigilant in water management. And uh, three key components of that, a valve, a filter, and a regulator, um, often overlooked, but very, very important um, to, uh, you know, kind of, kind of starting your, your water management program, you've got to have, uh, you got to have a solid understanding of those. And so we'll, we'll cover some of that today. Yeah, no, I don't, uh, don't view this as alarmist either, Andy. I think it's really important for people to understand where their water comes from. Uh, being in San Diego, I always say we're at the end of the hose, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it comes from a long ways to get to us, whether it's coming from uh, Northern California or uh, the Colorado River, we get it from both here in San Diego. So I think that's a good reminder and uh, that uh, whether we like it or not, we're really tied to all these other states for our, uh, uh, for our economic growth, right? Without water, you're not gonna grow as a city. And uh, that, that's where it becomes so important. So definitely appreciate you uh, mentioning this today. Yeah, absolutely. And the good news is the technology is there to manage water. We can continue to grow. We can continue to have economic development and, and grow food and with the water we have, we, you just got to implement uh, um, some, some smart best practices. Um, so today, uh, talking about three really basic but often overlooked components in uh, landscape irrigation, a valve, a filter and regulator. My guess would be 70, 80% of landscape contractors grab the same valve, the same filter, the same regulator without thinking twice of what role they play or if they even have the right one for their scenario and they just throw it in, right? Maybe there's some guys out there who, who are uh, um, taking a bigger look. So we'll get into some of those details today. But first I wanted to start the very, very basics, uh, at least in the landscape. Where do you find your valve, your filter, and your regulator? I think anybody who's walked through a park or a a landscape or your yard, you see a box that looks similar to this. Uh, this is a uh, this is a valve box, right? Uh, sometimes you see that dark green lid cover. Cover sometimes it's purple, sometimes it's it's tan. There's you know it can blend in uh, if you had desert landscape. Um, but the key to this here is when you pop open that box, what we see inside. And we open up the box, and lo and behold, we see a valve going from left to right across the screen. We see a valve, we see a filter and we see a pressure regulator. And, uh, you know, it's funny, Richard, you mentioned, you talk to contractors, you know, do they ever clean their filter? And they say, hey, what's, what's the filter? Several years ago, I was talking to my dad. Uh, he was asking some questions about his drip irrigation system. Something wasn't working right. I said, well, maybe your filter's plugged. And he checked your filter. He said, I don't have a filter. I said, no, you have to have a filter out there. I, I said, I promise you, you have a filter. And went out there and I showed him the filter. And he said, he said, that's a filter? I said, yeah. What did you think it was? He said, well, I, I thought that was the fertilizer applicator. I've been unscrewing that and dumping fertilizer in there so I could fertilize my, my plants every time I watered. And, you know, it's funny. I tell that story to people and a lot of that, that's, that's a common um, thought. And I don't know if at one point there was a product that looked like a filter that did that, but he was putting little tablets of uh, fertilizer in there to dissolve and uh, in with the system. So, um, yeah, I was, I was, I was going to say, he wasn't the first guy who ever did that, and uh, he won't be the last either. No, no. So that's our filter. So, all right, so we have valve filter regulator. Um, and uh, first things first, right, let's start with the valve. And uh, this is a, uh, I, got, I got a picture of three different size valves here on the right. These are, these are plastic. Typically, they're plastic. Occasionally, you'll still find a brass or, or metal one that's out there in the landscape. Um, 24 volt um, is most common. 
Uh, you also see a range of sizes in the landscape. You'll see is, is uh, you know, from three quarter inch uh, up to inch, inch and a half and two inch. Um, occasionally you may see something larger in the, in the landscape, but uh, I would say 95% of the time you're either gonna be dealing with three quarter inch or, or up to a two inch um, irrigation control valve. And, um, you know, I didn't put the three quarter inch in there, but each of the sizes, three quarter inch, one inch, inch and a half and two inch will have different flow characteristics and different pressure characteristics. And, um, and let, me, let me just back up. When we talk about valve size, we mean overall valve size. This is a two inch valve right here on the top. In the middle, that's a one inch valve. You can clearly see there's a difference in size but the size itself is referring to this pipe thread on the inside. So this, this would be, this is actually, uh, it happens to be inch and a half, not two inch, I apologize. That would be a, a inch and a half pipe thread. This would be one inch pipe thread there. Uh, this three quarter would have to be three quarter inch pipe thread. But each one has uh, also a larger diam diameter, larger body size, which means more water can physically flow through the valve at higher pressure. So each size allows you um, different flow characteristics and different size characteristics. So for example, uh, this three quarter inch valve that I have pictured here, it is rated uh, for a gallon per minute flow of 0.5 gallons per minute to a maximum of 22 gallons per minute with a pressure range of 4.3 to 40 PSI. That becomes important, especially in drip irrigation because in drip irrigation, we have a lot of times a low flow and a low pressure environment. Now in a low flow and a low pressure environment, if uh, your valve, let's say you have uh, a valve that's rated for five gallons per minute on the low end, but your flow is two gallons per minute, the valve will open up just fine. It just won't close. So it's, it'll always open. It's just a matter of getting it to close is, is usually the, the problem. So you want to make sure that when you're looking at your valve you understand the flow that's out in your in, in your zone if you have a very low flow or low pressure zone you got to make sure you have a drip valve that, that that matches that and what's unique about this nandan jane valve that we offer is it is both a low flow at 0.5 gallon per minute and a low pressure 4.3 psi so it gives you it covers both ends on on a drip uh drip situation so um so that's why I say for drip here at the end, you have to know your flow and pressure because uh, that's usually when you, you have problems um, um, on, the, on the low side. One other key that, uh, that I'll, I'll pass along, something I've learned, typically on the valve body, you'll see an arrow that will indicate which way the water runs. I had a friend call me up. He's like, man, I just installed my landscape. I opened up the main line, the sprinklers turn on. I can't get them to turn off. I'm crazy. You know, what's, what's going on here? He had his valve installed backwards. <laughs> he had uphill, downhill. And, and um, in that particular valve, there was an arrow on it. I said, hey, look at me, just follow, the, the water follows the arrow and goes through. Not all valves have, have that. For a lot of valves though, what I've learned, the solenoid is on the downhill side. And so that's an easy way to remember, um, you know, as the water flows, solenoid is on the downhill side. So just, uh, just one little trick or, or tip to help help folks out there remember. Hey Andy, we, we've got a question here uh, that came in. I want to remind everybody that uh, through the chat or through the Q&A, we'll take questions as well and I'll pass those on to Andy as we go. Uh, one of the questions we have already is uh, that kind of uh, red orange dot, you can barely see it on the side of the valve. Uh, what, what's that for? I don't see that on many valves. Yeah, so that is, I think we have that on the next next slide. We talk about key components, so it's a very timely question. Um, I'll start with that. You can see that little nozzle, no, not nozzle, that little uh, switch. That is a way to manually open the valve. So you can uh, you can flip that, and it'll cause a little bit of water to bleed in, and ultimately open the valve up manually without having to do it from your irrigation controller. On some valves, they'll put a handle on top of the solenoid, which is this. Uh, well, you see in the picture that says NDJ, 2W, NC, 24V, AC, that's a, that's a solenoid, or it's the picture in the lower right-hand corner. Um, you can, you, 
on, on some valves you twist the solenoid and that allows a little bit of water to bleed in. But this Nandan Jane valve is great. We put a little uh, little switch in there so you're not having to wear out or, or mess with the seals of the uh, solenoid. Hey Andy, have you ever uh, twisted a solenoid to turn it on and uh, have it break in front of a customer? Not in front of a customer, but I have twisted a solenoid to turn it on and it wasn't turning on, so I twisted more and it wasn't turning on, so I twisted more and then it came off. And that little, see that little cylinder, that, that metallic cylinder in the picture in the lower right-hand corner, there's a spring that holds that thing and that went flying up in the air, <laughs> fell down in the valve box. And the valve box, of course, was full of mud. And uh, yeah, it was, yeah. Um, I, I having love, that little red switch, on off switch is so nice. <laughs> yeah, I love it, right? Just for that reason, it's, uh, it, it, it's uh, definitely saves you a lot of time and, uh, and embarrassment. And embarrassment too, yeah. So a couple other key components you see, uh, looking at this picture, my cursor's not working. Um, oh, there it goes. Oh, th this guy right here, this, uh, this is a flow control handle. You can crank that down to, to either completely stop the flow or, or, or regulate the flow. Um, this is the valve body, of course, that makes sense. This, this top piece right here, this cap, right? The top piece of the valve unscrews. And when you take that off, there's, there's, a, there's a very key component. Um, Call this the diaphragm. Diaphragm is a piece of rubber. Um, it, it, it's, it's flexible. Um, it, uh, it's what controls the, the water, turns it on or off. And what usually happens, uh, these diaphragms will wear out. And that's why it, it, it's good to understand these. A lot of times you don't need necessarily need a new valve, you just need a new diaphragm. Um, the other very, very key component to this valve is the solenoid which is the, uh, it's the guy that's sitting right there, the cylinder sitting right on top of the valve, the wire sticking out. And that uh, receives an electrical pulse from your, uh, your irrigation controller. And that actuates a magnet, causes that little cylinder in there to, to suck up, allows a little bit of water to flow through, and that's what gets the valve open. Um, key components uh, of, of the valve are there. And then and when we look at these valves, you know, when, when things go wrong, it's typically um, going to be one of three key things, right? Uh, either it's stuck open um, or it won't turn on at all or it won't turn off, I guess, which is the same as stuck open or it's leaking uh, either around the valve itself or there's water weeping out of uh, downstream. You know, water's getting through the valve and coming out your emission device or your sprinkler. Um, in the case where the valve is stuck open, where it won't turn off, usually it could be one of two things. You have a, uh, a diaphragm that is bad, it's not good anymore, or you can have a little bit of debris stuck in there. Um, taking off that top hat, replacing the diaphragm or clearing debris is a quick solution. Other times where the valve just simply won't turn on, your solenoid has gone bad. And there's a couple ways to test that. You know, some uh, you can do uh, an electrical test. Other times when you look at the solenoid, you know right away because it's corroded and kind of looks like it's exploded. That's usually a pretty, pretty good indicator your solenoid is bad. Um, in the case of a leak, that could be a crack in the body, so you want to inspect that. Um, and then weeping valves, that, that again could be a bad, a bad diaphragm. And uh, you know, replacing a diaphragm it can be a simple and easy fix. And those are, those are, those are you know, basic keys of troubleshooting um, uh, your, your, your valves out there. Yeah, so for the, uh, for the diaphragm, Andy, I can just pop those six screws out, right? And uh, the diaphragm's right there. It's right there. It comes out. There's a there's a spring, a little needle, but the diaphragm. Oh, make sure you have the right diaphragm for that valve. Uh, they're not always interchangeable, so you got to understand. Uh, you, you know, getting the right valve for the the uh, I'm sorry, the right diaphragm for the valve you have in the field. And I'd say that would be true for uh, solenoids as well. Sometimes there's different the, the resistance, the ohms are just slightly different. You want to make sure you're matching that up. But um, those are those are readily available pieces, I, I would venture to guess that every good irrigation tech has those backup pieces on his truck ready to go and can make those repairs in the field very quickly. Yeah, excellent. Yeah. So, so um, yeah, so that, that's, that's the valve. So next in line, uh, we come to, to filters. Uh, a filter is, I mean, it's exactly that, it filters out debris. Um, if you had a large amount of debris enter your, your line, get past the valve, uh, sand, even sand can clog sprinkler spray heads. I've seen sand clog sprinklers. 
it gets even worse with drip irrigation systems that really require filtration. So, um, you know, a lot of times people think drip, that's just for, that's just, I'm sorry, uh, filtration, that's just for drip. That's not always true. Uh, if you have poor water quality, uh, filtration is for spray as well. So um, uh, filters are, are very important. Um, first thing to, to, to go over, keys to remember for filters, there are screen filters and there are disc filters. And if you look at this picture on the top of this, these red, uh, red disc, this is a disc filter, right? Looks a little bit different than this filter right here. You see a screen, that's a screen filter. Um, when to use which one, if your water has a lot of organic material, a lot of algae or moss in it, use a disc filter. If your water has a lot of sand or, or, or shell in it, uh, you, you'll use a screen filter. And uh, so typically out west, I think most, most guys are probably filtering for sand. I know down in Florida, they're filtering for shell quite a bit. You get in some of these intermountain states where they're pulling ditch water to water their irrigation. I, go, I know guys in Utah and Colorado um, deal with organic material. Um, so in that case, uh, they'd be using a, uh, a disc filter. So um, size of filters, right? You, again, you have a three quarter inch, there's inch, there's inch and a half, there's two inch. In fact, you can make filters all the way up to 12 inch in size when you get into a large uh, um, agriculture applications. But in the landscape, you're going to be dealing with three quarter inch, inch and a half and two inch. And rather than size, you think, well, if my valve is the inch, my filter must be one inch. That's not necessarily true. You need to understand the flow of both the valve and the demand of the flow of your landscape and match the flow to that. So for example, uh, if I had a landscape that is requiring you know, five gallons per minute, um, even though I had a one inch valve, I could use with a bushing, with a reducer, a three quarter inch filter because a three quarter inch filter, it's nine gallons per minute max. So you wanna make sure you understand the flow demands of your zone um, and, and, and matching it there. Um, so that becomes, uh, that becomes important. Um, not necessarily just matching it to the size of the valve itself. Hey, Andy, uh, these uh, screen filters or disc filters, um, on my refrigerator, you know, I just change that filter every six months. Uh, do you change these out? Do you clean them? What do you do with them? Yeah, so we'll talk about that in a second. Absolutely, you need, you need to be checking these filters. I would say minimum quarterly. Uh, check your filter, especially if you're in a hard water environment or you're pulling uh, water with a lot of sand, you need to be checking these filters um, uh, potentially even weekly if your water quality is really bad. And you're checking for two things. Number one, the way the filter works is it traps all that debris at the bottom of the filter in, your, in the debris basin, which is this. And the next picture I have, you'll see, we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit more. So you need to blow that out, but also uh, you need to that, that debris is clogged inside the filter that needs to be cleaned out or it's possible if you have a lot of sand in your filter um sandblasting can you think of sandblasting on metal it takes a little bit of the metal off well as that sand is going through the filter it could it could it could um erode your filter itself to where no, nothing is filtered anymore so it's good to inspect those um if you you know in in southern nevada where our landscape water is also culinary water quality is really high that I might inspect those quarterly. If I was in a poor water environment, I might do it weekly or monthly. Uh, yeah, I remember a few years ago, Andy, when you and I went to Grand Junction, Colorado together, and no matter what we were talking about, they wanted to talk about filters. <laughs> That's all they wanted to talk about. So you can see if you've got a filtration problem or if you've got dirty water, this is uh, very consuming to you as a contractor, right? Uh, this is what they spend all their time uh, fighting uh, if, if they have a problem. Clogged filter means no water to your plants. That means either lost crop or lost landscape. Um, and don't think you can, you can bypass the filter. I'll tell a quick story. I've, I've told this before, and I won't say who the contractor, what the property was, but I was meeting with a contractor on a, uh, one of the, the resort casinos here in Las Vegas. And he said, hey, my... my uh, um, irrigation system's not working. He said it was working and then it stopped and I don't know what's going on. And we turned it on and we're looking at it. No water's coming out of the emitters. So we go over to the valve box and we open up the valve box and sitting in the valve box outside of the filter was the screen. And I pointed to it and the foreman's like, yeah, 
a couple of weeks ago, this whole thing stopped working. So I don't know what this thing is, but I took it out and then it worked really well. And now it's not working at all anymore. <laughs> they destroyed several zones um, by taking out the filter. And what was amazing, the filter screen, you could see it was jammed full of rocks and plastic and all sorts of debris. And I said, you know, all that debris is now out in your line. So that was an expensive lesson to learn, but always use a filter, always use a filter. Um, kind of moving along, keys to remember for filtration, there are different filters. Not only are there different sizes of filter, there's different quality of filter. If you're in a home environment, you can get away with probably cheap plastic, low pressure rated filter, 30 PSI, right? Uh, if you're in a commercial environment and your uh, mainline pressure coming in is 100 PSI, 120 PSI, you better go with a glass filled nylon reinforced uh, heavy duty uh, filter that can withstand pressures up to 150 PSI. And uh, so, so understanding not just size, but the, the intended pressure um, helps too, because at too much pressure, the fil filter doesn't work anymore and debris blows right past it. Either that or the filter fails and just blows apart and you have really huge waterways. But either way, your plants aren't getting water and then you're going to be in a world of hurt. Um, last, so, yeah. Andy, if I know my, my pressure when I'm running my system is like uh, 80 uh, PSI or 60 PSI, is it ever higher than that when you turn a system on or, or, or something like that? Uh, I, I guess it could be, depends on where you're measuring it. If you're, if you're getting, you know, 80 PSI ahead of the valve, uh, you'll be safe to know it's, it's going to be less after that. But if you're getting 80 PSI at the very end of a line, um, you, you, you probably ought to measure closer to, to make sure you're understanding what it is. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, last key for, uh, filtration is you need to, each of these filter screens, uh, whether, um, whether you're using a nylon mesh or, or a stainless steel mesh, they, they have different size openings. We call that, we call it mesh, but it's a 30, 50, 100, 150, or 200 mesh. When we're talking about mesh measurements, the higher the number, the finer material that's filtered. So uh, you need to understand uh, manufacturer recommendation for your irrigation system what they recommend and then select the appropriate filter to go along with that. So for example, drip irrigation, uh, 150 or 200 mesh is typically uh, what is recommended. So, um, again, talking about screens, you know, I mentioned nylon and I mentioned stainless steel. Uh, filtration is all about surface area. When you get these larger, nicer stainless steel mesh filters, not only are they a higher durability, but there's more surface area, which means more filtration capability, which means um, better protection for your system. Uh, these plastic bodied ones, like you see this yellow ribbed one on the on the left, even, uh, you know, typically those are made out of a nylon mesh, smaller surface area, and they wear out quicker. So just kind of a, a pro tip here, one of two pro tips for filtration go with a the, the uh, a filter screen, even though the flow and the size of the filter itself may be the same. If you have a, a larger screen, it means more surface area, which means better filtration and better quality in the long run. And uh, of course, stainless steel just lasts a whole lot longer. So um, I would uh, I would mention that. So it's a, uh, something I didn't know actually as a contractor that I've, I've learned since working at Jane that uh, I think would be valuable for contractors to know. Um, Key components, uh, filter body, you can see, uh, this is the body of the filter. This cap right here unscrews and the bottom of this cap, this piece right here is what's called the debris basin. As the water comes through, debris is filtered out, it gets trapped right here in the debris basin, okay? Uh, we know what the screen is, we looked at that on the previous screen, um, previous slide. The other thing we see, you see that cap at the bottom of the debris basin. Uh, you can have a cap right there or you can have a valve. That's used to flush in maintenance, to flush the debris out of the filter itself. So uh, whether you had a cap or in the, the illustration below, you see there's a little ball valve at the end of that debris basin. It's a simple way to allow you to get the debris out because if that debris builds up in the debris basin, it'll build up so much that water can't flow through anymore. So that's part of your ongoing maintenance, checking that, making sure you keep that clean. And then 
my my second pro tip for the filter section is use use this filter you see on the screen right here this is a jane api spin clean filter it is a self cleaning filter uh it's it's unique it's got that you see that green uh cap it's called a spin cap creates a vortex as the water rushes through the filter debris is held in that cycle right forced right down the debris basin but it also as the water is going through there cleans off the filter screen itself so you don't have to go back and do that um, more surface area so it's better filtration spin clean technology so it's a self-cleaning filter and uh, believe it or not this uh, 4eh series uh, our heavy duty spin clean filter has the highest rated operating pressure in the industry at 150 psi uh, for uh, um, this whole three quarter inch, inch or inch and a half or two inch filter. So um, that's, uh, that's, a, that's a, another pro tip um, that I have for, uh, for our contractors out there. Yeah, I remember most of the contractors, all the contractors we talked to in uh, Grand Junction, they were using the spin clean. This is what they uh, live by yeah. because it really, uh, it really uh, fit their need and uh, reduced a lot of maintenance and uh, troubleshooting for them. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it does. It's um, you, you pay you pay a couple dollars more for it, maybe three to five dollars more for a uh, one inch filter. But the the amount of headache, the amount of labor you save in the long run is totally worth it. It is a uh, it's a very worthwhile investment. So, and we talked about this a little bit ago, but you know the, the maintenance keys for filtration: flush the debris basin, clean the screen or the disc. Um, inspect it for damage, uh, either replace the screen or sometimes those filter bodies can crack over time. So you want to make sure there's no leaks there um, or just use a spin, a spin clean filter that, that, that uh, cleans it for you. So those are, uh, those are the filter, filter maintenance keys. And again, uh, depending on the quality of your water, you might do that weekly. It could be monthly, it could be quarterly, but you do want to make sure that's part of your, uh, your ongoing um, uh, process. And Andy, uh, we have another question here, and it's um, just one more time. Uh, is there any rule of thumb of when to use a disc and when to use a screen filter? Yes, if you are filtering out algae or moss or any type of organic, uh, you know, stuff growing in the water, use a disc filter. Um, if your water is full of sand or sometimes plastics or shell, you'll want to use a screen. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna anticipate the next question. What if I have both? Uh, here's my recommendation. And of course, every scenario is different, but this is what I've recommended. You know, again, going back to our, our, the guys I know in Utah and Colorado, they're pulling water out of a reservoir of a ditch, put a large disc filter there, right? And then you get down to the zone itself, put a screen filter to keep the sand out. And that seems to work pretty well. Yeah, great idea, yeah. So both. <laughs> That's like belts and suspenders. <laughs> okay, the next in our line here is our pressure regulator. Um, pressure regulator is pretty straightforward, pretty simple. It's exactly what it says it is. You use a pressure regulator to reduce the pressure, regulate the pressure, but in this case, reduce pressure. Uh, especially in drip, but even in spray environments. And drip irrigation, you know, your drip emitters, your emitter line, your components of a drip system have a, a specific pressure that pressure maximum they're rated for. So for example, it might be, you know, 50 PSI. If you, uh, if you, if you shot, you know, 80, 100 PSI through that, you're going to destroy your drip system. So you put a regulator on there that, uh, that redu will reduce the pressure that will maintain the pressure at a optimal operating, um, um, range. Uh, and that can be true for spray irrigation as well. Uh, I know that those, those for a lot of those sprinklers are designed to work for in, in a specific pressure. So, and that there's times where these can be, these can be beneficial there. Uh, you see, we see some, uh, some, some common sizes. Again, you, you, this is a common thread throughout uh, uh, valve filter regulator. We have three quarter inch, we have inch, we have inch and a quarter. It's, it's no different for the pressure regulators. Uh, these are pipe thread, um, same as the filter, same as the valve. Uh, these are, they're made, they're made to, to, to uh, kind of screw on together. So those are the common sizes. Um, another key to remember though, and this is again, another common theme for both the valve and the filter. 
we want to match the regulator flow to the system flow, right? What's, what's the valve flow? What's the filter flow? Well, those were determined based on the needs of the system. We want to make sure we're matching the regulator for that as well. So a low flow regulator, like you see uh, this, this picture on the bottom, that's a low flow pressure regulator. It can have a, a, a flow range from 0.5 gallons per minute to eight gallons per minute. And those are actually two different low flow regulators, but that's the range within uh, low flow regulator. Medium flow regulator, again, these are two different regulators, but the range can be from four to 20 gallons per minute. And then a high flow regulator, you'll see 10 to 32 gallons per minute. Um, that's, that's for the flow. Um, and then for the pressure, uh, you can see anything from a, a reducing the pressure all the way down to six PSI for some very, very low pressure environments um, up to about uh, up to 50 PSI um, and, and everything in between. So we see uh, in the pressure regulator, both flow, um, we need to pay attention to flow and pay attention to pressure. And then anticipating the question if, uh, well, how do I know which pressure I should use? What, 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 what pressure do I regulate to? Um, if, if, if I had a drip irrigation system, let's say I had click tip emitters um, uh, on, a, on a valve, or I had Jane Total CV on a valve, and I know that the, you know, those are, those are good up to about, those will um, compensate pressure up to about 50 PSI, I would want to keep my the pressure of that zone under 50 so i'd probably go in at, at a 40 psi regulator now if i had a valve that was full of uh, uh flag emitters you know that's a jane flag emitter that's a turbulent flow when we say hey this, this particular emitter is two gallons per hour that's two gallons per hour at 25 psi so in that case i'd, I'd try to match the the uh, pressure regulator as close to uh uh that is possible so that's that's kind of the, uh, the, the, the two key differences there. Um, again, you can go back to your manufacturer recommendations to understand that. So uh, Andy, where do I find this information? I think that's great that you know that, right? What the, uh, the PSI recommendation is uh, for the individual components. Where would uh, one of our uh, viewers find that? Yeah, you can find that in technical brochures. Or, so for example, Jane out on our website, you can uh, you can find technical brochures to specific product. A lot of times that's mentioned in catalog. Um, um, parts catalogs themselves will have that information, but manufacturers, it's something manufacturers publish, both for the valve. It, um, you go out to our catalog, you can see the flow range for the valve, for the filter, for the regulator. You see all that as well as, well as uh, the individual components themselves. Um, you know, maximum pressure, minimum, you know, there's minimum opening pressure to keep in mind as well. So uh, all those things are published in, in manufacturer uh, catalogs. In fact, um, it'd be a, a, maybe another webinar is, uh, it could be a topic just on that, right? Go through the catalog and seeing what information is out there. Um, you can also uh, connect with a distributor or, uh, you know, we, we have uh, experts here at Jane that can, that can help. Uh, we help our customers with this kind of stuff all the time as well. So then uh, there we have it. Here's our system, valve, filter, and regulator. Now, in a couple slides, I'm gonna show my contact information and I would invite uh, the viewers out there today to reach out to me and uh, explain to me what's wrong with this picture. And maybe, that, maybe there'll be a little bit of a prize, a giveaway for uh, anybody who connects uh, what that is. Uh, a couple best practices here, do you see in this valve, bo valve box, Either the wire connectors, um, those are waterproof connectors. Please do that. Uh, water, believe it or not, will wick up through open connectors up through the line, get into solenoid and fry it. So having a waterproof connector is key. Um, the valve, this valve box is clean, gravel at the bottom. So that's a really good looking valve box. All too often, you'll, you'll find this halfway buried in, in mud um, and wonder why the system isn't working. So. so Andy, if they contact you and tell you what's wrong with that photo, what do they get? Uh, I don't know. Maybe maybe a uh, a free filter. <laughs> well, uh, a spin clean filter, the best filter you've ever used. Uh, maybe, maybe we'll. You know, I don't know. Maybe that or Starbucks gift card. I, haven't, I, I didn't think that far ahead. Um, but come come with the right answer. Let's have a conversation and see. <laughs> okay. All right. Last uh, 
last slide here is just a scenario. I'm just going to walk you through, okay, how do I know what to choose? So here's my scenario. This is a small yard. This would be almost, you know, could, could be my front yard. I got a, uh, a landscape design that requires a flow of 240 gallons per hour. That's, that's, that's a 122 gallon per hour emitters. And that equates to four gallons per minute. Uh, mainline pressure is 100 PSI. Uh, the manufacturer is telling me I need a minimum uh, filtration of 120 mesh. And my drip system components themselves have a maximum pressure rating of 55 PSI. So as I look at that, I'm, and, and um, my main line coming in is one inch. I didn't put that up there. My main line coming in is one inch. Um, so knowing that though, I could, I could from that main line, I could uh, put a bushing on that, size down to a three quarter inch valve because the maximum flow range is 22 gallons per minute. So I'd be covered on a uh, three quarter inch valve. My filter size could also be three quarter inch. Um, because uh, that would be a nine gallon per minute max flow and I'd be at four gallons per minute. But I'd wanna go with a heavy duty filter to hold up to the, the systems. I couldn't go with a, a 30, 50 or 80 PSI rated filter. I'd have to go with the 150 rated PSI filter to hold up to the my system. Um, I would choose 150 mesh because 150 is between 100 and, or 120 is between 100 and 150. So I'd go with the 150 mesh and then my pressure regulator, again, I'd go with a three quarter inch low flow regulator that had an eight gallon per minute max. And I'd, I'd probably go right around uh, 40 PSI, 35 PSI would be acceptable as well. In fact, 25 to 35, I'd say 25 to 40 PSI is most common out in the landscape. Um, but if you'll notice in this scenario, and I've mentioned this in two previous webinars, when you're designing these zones, you never want to go to the max flow of, of the system. If you'll notice, four gallon per minute is the zone requirement, and that's about half of what a three quarter inch valve, three quarter inch filter, and three quarter inch regulator can handle. Always leave, leave room. My, my rule of thumb is design at half, go at half. That way you could expand it into the future. So. And with that, um, I'll take any questions. Andy, I think you uh, did a great job today. Thanks very much. And uh, I fed the questions that came in to you as we were going. So uh, uh, I want to say uh, great job. You really, I think, helped clear some things up. Uh, and uh, really, I, 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 you made the great point about matching the flows. And I think that's an area where a lot of people uh, miss, right? They just grab what's ever on the truck or whatever they can find at the store that's in stock. And I think uh, you, uh, you definitely saved them some work down the line. So uh, thanks so much for doing this. Uh, we really appreciate it. I wanna thank everybody uh, on today for uh, coming, uh, coming to visit and, uh, and watching this. We know your time's uh, valuable, especially right now. And uh, we appreciate that. Uh, so thank you. I also wanna mention uh, Friday, uh, we're going to be talking about five tips to uh, make your videos better. You know, video is so important in our industry right now, both in landscape and ag. We've got Michael Derwenko that's going to be on Friday, and we're going to be talking about five tips to improve your videos. So that should be great. All our trainings, of course, are available on the Jane's USA website, and we're on Apple, Spotify, and Google Podcasts as well. So while you're driving around, you can listen and educate as well. So again, Andy, thank you. Thanks, everybody, uh, for joining us today. And uh, hopefully we'll see you all on Friday talking about video. Thanks again. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Richard.